Don't you worry about a thing, Bridgeway. Praise the Lord. We give God all the glory. It was one year ago that I preached from this stage live to an entire congregation of people. Last year at this time, 53 Sundays or so ago, we preached God's word, and then that week, we ended up, without even realizing we were going to do it, we ended up closing our in-person church services and going fully live on broadcast. And here we are now, one year later. And uh, who would have known? You know, back then when we made the decision that week, even before the governor said that the churches would need to uh, be closed because of the buildings and the spreading of the COVID virus, we made the decision before he came out with his, but we were all thinking, man, we might have to do this until Easter. Well, look at us now. We thought, well, maybe May. And then we start talking about June reopening and then July. And we started going through these phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, maybe October. And here we are the first Sunday in March. And I'm back live on stage. This was a live service without the congregation here uh, in the building. But I know that our congregation is right there. You're in your homes. You're in your cars. You're together watching uh, this broadcast. Groups of you all over, thousands of you. And I am just so grateful that this year you've been able to stick with us through our broadcast services. We lift up those that have lost their lives. We pray for those of you who are uh, dealing with uh, COVID virus today and we know that this can be a very depressing time as well that's why i want to do this series on the heels of the conversations of hope i wanted to do a four-week series called i hope today's my my topic is from hopeless to hopeful next week i'm going to talk about filling your hope tank the week after that, feeling like a middle child. What's the relationship between uh, faith, hope, and love? And then we'll end it with fellowshipping with others to keep hope alive. And then we'll have Easter, which our Easter service is going to be called Healing. You're not going to want to miss the next four or five weeks. Let's pray together, and then we'll talk about from hopeless to hopeful. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we serve a God of hope. We commit this service, this sermon, Lord, our worship to you. We thank you, Lord, that you know our name. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to worry about a thing. And now I commit not only this word, but every listener, every worshiper, every member, every partner, every ministry champion from Bridgeway Community Church and beyond, wherever they are in the world, I pray favor and blessing over their life in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Are you a runner? I don't mean running from the police, <laughs> running from creditors or from even attackers. I mean exercise. You know, there are people who actually, on purpose, <laughs> put on exercise clothing and sneakers, and they go running for exercise. They run three, four, eight, ten miles per day. You know, I did this many years ago when I was in the Army in the basic training in my young 20s. We had to run three miles a day. And I remember running to a point where you would get something called a second wind. Have you ever heard of that before? Your second wind was that point where you felt like your body seemed to get an extra burst of energy where you could go on running in a rhythm and at a pace where you were, quote, unquote, in the zone. After several miles, or in my case, several feet, there comes a point where you finally are just done running. <laughs> you, you are totally exhausted. The running is no longer exhilarating. You're exhausted. And then you start doing something called panting. And this is the analogy that the psalmist gives us in Psalm chapter 42. If you have a copy of the scriptures, would you go with me to Psalm 42? 
You know what a Bible is with the pages and all that. I know some of y'all probably have it on your computer or your smartphone, and that's fine too, but it's a good old-fashioned Bible, so I'm going to leaf the pages. Listen. Yeah. I'm going all the way to Psalm 42, and in verse 1, listen to what it says, and I'll just read the, the whole psalm to you. It's only 10 or 11 verses. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go and with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Did you hear that? He says, these things I remember as I pour out my spirit, how I used to go with the multitude to the house of God. Remember when we used to go to the multitude to the house of God with shouts of joy, thanksgiving among the festive throng? Verse 5, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will Yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony and my foes taunt me, saying to me all the day long, where is your God? The final verse, verse 11, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will praise him, my Savior and my God. The writer of this psalm says that as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. After running hard, uh, maybe running mile after mile from predators, the writer says, my soul <sighs> pants. But if you are truly a runner, you know that not only do you pant, but you're parched. He goes on to say that I'm, I'm thirsty. He says, a deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You're not only panting, but you're parched. Do you know what it means to truly be thirsty? You've been running You've been exercising. You've not had water. And then finally you get to the water and you drink it and it quenches your thirst. Many of you know what it's like to pant, to be parched. The psalmist says, my soul thirsts. And when one is panting and, and parched, there's an emptiness. There's an exhaustion. There's a weakness that needs to be addressed. And now is the time for recovery. Now is the time to get more energy and water and food and regeneration will bring you back to life from being completely drained. The psalmist is saying, I am completely drained. I'm spent. I'm depressed. I'm downcast. Do you know what it's like to be drained, spent, downcast? The writer describes this state of mind and soul with honesty, and he goes on, and he begins to mention his tears. Check out verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night. He he mentions his soul being downcast, and he, he says that I've been crying day and night. Back to verse 3, not only do we see his tears, but he mentions being taunted. He says, my tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? In verse 10, if you flip over to verse 10, it says, my bones suffer mortal agony and my foes 
taunt me, saying all day long, where is my God? So he says, not only am I drained, my soul is panting, my soul is thirsty, but on top of all of that, I've got the enemy that increasingly taunts me. He mentions his tears. He mentions the taunting. And then he also mentions the timing. Back to verse Three, he says, day and night. In verses 8 and verses 10, he says, day and night. He says in verse 10, they taught me the enemy all day long. In other words, this isn't a, this isn't a passing phase. This isn't a pity party for 30 minutes. This is all day, all night. And he mentions day and night three times in the passage. Some of you know exactly what this psalmist is talking about. Even as I preach now and read the passage, it resonates with your soul because that's where you are. You know what it's like to be downcast, not for minutes or hours, but days, weeks, months. For some of you, years and seasons. This is not just a physical problem. This is not just burnout. It's, 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 it's psychological. It's, it's mental. It's, it's soulish. He says, my soul is panting. Soul and psyche is the same thing in the original language, and it mentions soul six times in these 11 verses. This is deep, friends. This is not just go get rest tonight and wake up tomorrow and feel better. This is deep in his soul, deep in his mind, deep in his heart. He's depressed. He's downcast. He's drained. He's panting like a deer that's been running with predators behind him. And he just needs to quench his thirst. And as soon as he pauses to quench his thirst, then the enemy comes after him again. And he says, how long, God? Some of you are in a place in your marriage. How long, God? Some of you are in a place in your body. How long, God? Some of you are in a place in your business. How long, God? How long do I have to endure this? How long do I have to go through this sad, sorrowful, and sick situation? I can't take it anymore. Why are you so downcast? Oh, my soul. And as he mentions all of this, it's reminiscent of what many of us have gone through. He says, I remember when we used to go into the house of the Lord, the multitude worshiping God. I don't even have that. You know, this year of COVID has waned on many of us, worn down many of us maybe even weakened some of us. And like the runner who pants and thirsts, maybe you need that second wind. Maybe you need that burst of energy. Maybe your soul is downcast. He mentions the word downcast three times. Verse five, verse six, verse 11. Well, I have good news for you. Help is on the way if you put your hope in God. Help is on the way if you put your hope in God. If I could put my sermon in a sentence, it would be this. When all hope is gone, the God of hope is not. He is still there. When all hope is gone, the God of hope is not. He's still there. The writer teaches us how to bounce back like that runner who becomes energized with that second win. And what I want to do is give you three ways to transition from hopeless to hopeful. Three ways to transition from hopeless to hopeful. Here's number one. Look up to God and remember his person. You know, when you're downcast, the only way you can look up, but look all the way up. When you're down, you can look up, but look all the way up. And remember God. You see, the enemy wants you to forget God. He wants you to forget his faithfulness. He wants you to forget his deliverance. He wants you to forget his power. He wants you to think that God has forsaken you and he's not there. And so you ask, where's God? Where's God? 
in verses 6 and 7, we see that he begins to remember. And it says in verses 6 and 7, he says, my, my soul is downcast with, within me. He's, but check it out. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls the deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. What is he saying? He's saying, God, as I remember you, as I look up all the way up and I remember you, I can see that you are a God that's bigger than my situation. When I look up, you're, you're higher than the, than the heights of, of Hermon and the, and the mountains of Misar. You're, you're, you're higher than that. And, and, and you're deeper than the deepest deep where the breakers like run over you like Jonah in the water. You're, you're like the land of Jordan when you gave us the land of Jordan. You serve a God who's higher than your tallest problem. You serve a God who is deeper than your lowest depression. You serve a God who walks with you on the land of Jordan. God, at all levels, you're with me, you walk with me. You're higher than the tallest mountain, lower than the deepest, darkest valley, lower than the ocean floor. You are there all around me. And when I look up and I remember God, I remember that he's bigger than all of my problems. But he goes on. And he says, he remembers and recalls what God has done for him. Check out verse 8. It says, by day the Lord directs his love. So he's a God of love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He's a God of life. In verse 9 he says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? He's the God on whom I can lean. In other words, when you look up and you look to God and remember him, remember that he's a God of love. He's a God of life. And like a rock, he's a God on whom, on whom I can lean. And so even as the writer is trying to figure this out, as he looks up and he remembers the person of God, he remembers that he's bigger than any problem that I have. He remembers that he's a God of love a God of life, and a God on whom I can leave, lean. And the enemy is always trying to get you to think the opposite. He's not the God of love. He's the God that's really hateful and disappointed with you. He's not the God of life. He's the God of death. Why don't you just roll over and die? He's not a God who's like a rock that I can lean on. He's a God that is flimsy and sinking. Those are lies from the devil. And when you are in a downcast, panting, and parched state, what you need is a second wind of God's truth. So you have to look up all the way up and remember God's person. Remember his person, that he's a God of love, life, and on whom you can lean. But there's a second way to transition from hopeless to hopeful, and that is this. Look up to God and release your praise. Look up to God and release your praise. Check out verse 5 and verse 11. In verse 5, we see it in 11, and we even see it in the next chapter again. But this is what it says. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Here it is. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Look at verse 11. Why so downcast, O my soul? Why disturbed within me? Here it is. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now keep going to the next chapter. Look at verse 5. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. He says it again. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. We said look up and remember his person, but now we see the second way to transition from hopeless to hopeful is to look up all the way up and release your praise. You see, once you remember who God is, you must release your praise. He even says in verse 4, even as you pour out your soul to him, he says, as I pour out my soul in verse 4, even as you pour out your soul to him, pour out your praise to him. Yes, you can be panting. Yes, you can be parched. 
Yes, you can pour your soul out to God. But as you're pouring your soul out, release your praise to God because that's what's going to turn around your situation. Even as you are thirsty, even as your soul is hurting, get the energy to just say, God, I praise you anyway. He says, I put your hope in God, but I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. As you pour your soul out in prayer, also pour your soul out in praise. It says three times, yet will I praise him, yet will I praise him, yet will I praise him, my Savior and my God. God, I need you to save me right now from this pit of depression, from this downcast spirit. I'm parched, I'm, I'm panting, I'm, I'm pouring out my soul, but I'm also going to pour out my praise. And you say, well, pastor, how do I... How do I praise God? You praise God by saying, praise God. You praise God by singing, praise God. Maybe you just say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You can, you can do that in prayer. You can sing Amazing Grace, but change the words to praise him. Amazing Grace. You can do that. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise Go ahead and hit that note for me because I can't do it right now. But you can do that in your closet, in your living room, in your car, in the pit that you find yourself in. As you pour out your heart, pour out your praise. You can praise him by name. God, I, I praise you. Jesus, I praise you. Holy Spirit, I, I praise you. I, I praise Jehovah Jireh. I, I I praise Jehovah Rapha, the healer. I, I praise Jehovah Sabiyah. I, I praise you, Jehovah Nisi. I praise you, wonderful counselor, mighty God. I praise you, Emmanuel. You can take the different names of God and praise the name of God. What have we learned so far? We learned there are three ways to transition from hopeless to hopeful. We said, remember his person, release your praise. Lastly, look up to God all the way up and rest in his plans. Rest in his plans. <laughs> Someone needs to hear me say today, I'm, I'm looking at you right now live from Bridgeway. And what I'm saying to you today is God has a plan. Sometimes what we got to do is rest in God's plans. When our plans don't work out, we get downcast and, and disoriented because we, we felt so good about our plans. But God wants you to know that his plans are better than yours. Since you're in Psalm 42, if you'll just flip over to Psalm 40, you read the first 10 verses on your own. But let me read verse 1, 2, and 5. David, the writer of this psalm, says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Verse 5, many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you, check it out, the things you planned for us, no one can recount to you. God has plans for you, the things you planned for us. Friends, while we remember his person, He's bigger than all of our problems. He's a God of love, life, on whom we can lean. And while we release our praise to God, we must always remember that God has a plan and we can rest in him. Help is on the way if you put your hope in God. And when all hope is gone, the God of hope is not. He's still there. And since we looked at Psalm 40, I want to bring you to what Jeremiah 29, 11 says about plans. What Jeremiah says is like this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, 
plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you, listen, hope and the future. Did you get it? He mentions the word plans three times. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan for you, dear children. In fact, he doesn't just have a plan for you. He has plans for you. It says that he has plans for you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope. God not only has a plan, God has plans for you. Plans for your family. Plans for your future. Plans to give you hope. Look up and remember his person. Look up and release your praise. Look up and rest in his plans. You know, I started today's sermon with really an animal analogy of the deer. We saw that in Psalm 42.1, as the deer pants for the water. But I want to end today's sermon with another animal. You see, while the deer runs on the land and is is parched and, and is panting, God hasn't called you to be a deer. In fact, the animal I want to talk to you about is an eagle. You see, an eagle can soar in the sky. And in Isaiah chapter 40, it puts it this way. We saw Psalm 40, but listen to Isaiah 40, verse 11. It says, those who hope in the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. It says that those who hope on the Lord will get a second win. They will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. I'm here to tell someone today that you no longer have to be faint. You no longer have to just walk. You no longer have to run panting and parched, but you will fly like an eagle. You will soar in the way God has created you with his wind beneath your wings. I'm here to tell someone today that the word hope stands for holy optimism based on positive expectations. Holy optimism based on positive expectations. It's a story of a baby eagle that was up in a nest. And when the mother eagle flew away, the baby eagle's egg fell down into a patch of prairie chickens. And when he came out of his shell, he looked around and all he saw were prairie chickens. And so that little baby eagle thought he was what? A prairie chicken. And so when he went out with his fellow prairie chickens to go walk on the prairie, one day he looked up and he saw this beautiful creature soaring through the sky. And he said to his fellow prairie chickens, I want to do that. I want to fly. And his prairie chicken brothers and sisters said, you can't fly because you're a prairie chicken. And prairie chickens can't fly. But many of you know that the issue wasn't about his ability. The issue was about his mentality. He didn't know what he was purposed to do. That little eagle didn't know what God had planned for him. Because he was in a patch of prairie chickens, he thought he was limited like a prairie chicken. The reality is you can do more than whatever you think you can do because God has put his spirit in you. The bottom line is some of you need to get away from the prairie chickens you've been hanging with. And God has used this pandemic to give you a new crowd, to give you new connections, to take you into a new level of flight. And God wants you to soar and not sink. When all hope is gone, the God of hope is not. Put your hope in God. 
Stop listening to the other prairie chickens that cannot fly around you. Get with those who know how to lift their wings. And so that little eagle got up on a rock and jumped off and he fell down. But then he climbed a tree and got on a branch, jumped off and he fell down. And then he crawled up that tree again, jumped off. And before you know it, he lifted up his wings and air came up under him and then he fell down. And so he climbed all the way to the top of the tree and then he jumped off. And when he was high enough, the wind blew up under his wings and he began to fly and he began to soar and he began to soar over the other prairie chickens because he began to live out his potential because he realized that sometimes God will take you through a prairie chicken patch to show you what life is like on the land, what life is like to pant and to be parched. But if you will trust God, if you will believe God, you will realize you don't have to stay on the ground, but you can soar like an eagle. Friends, I'm here to tell you today, put your hope in God. God wants you to soar and not to sink. And I'm here to tell you today that I don't build my hope on man's plans. I don't build my hope on political parties. I don't build my hope on popular pastors or Bible teachers. I don't build my hope on bank accounts and businesses. I don't build my hope on the promises of human beings. I don't build my hope on social media influencers and the number of likes and followers and fans and retreats. I'm here to tell you today that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand.